I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I thought I might be, for that's clear anybody to see. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not. Welcome to the first episode of Brains Matter for 2007. This is episode 12 for the 9th of January 2007. I'm the ordinary guy and I'll bring you stories on science, curiosities, knowledge, and anything else that's interesting. I hope you all had a fantastic new year, and that 2007 is a good year for you. On today's show, you hear about dark matter, the pin of the week, I'll bring you some of the latest news in the world of knowledge, and some listener feedback. And welcome to all the new listeners of the show. I hope you enjoy it, and you're more than welcome to participate and become part of the show yourselves. Newton's laws, which have governed physics and astronomy for the past 300 years, made certain predictions about the way the universe existed. For years and years, it was assumed that we knew all the stuff that exists in the universe. By 1974, though, a couple of professors from Princeton University in the US decided to look at the universe and find out exactly how much stuff was actually out there. Professor James Peebles and Jerry Ostriker decided to model the galaxies on a computer But what they found was that if they put in what you could see in the sky, then the models wouldn't work. The galaxies would either fly apart or warp. The solution was to have more stuff in the universe. More stuff would provide more gravity, and this would prevent the universe from flying apart. There wasn't enough stuff in the universe model to hold it together. To account for this, Ostriker and Peebles introduced a notion of dark matter. It was something that at that point hadn't been seen or measured. It was a theoretical concept that accounted for the difference in the mathematics. Back in the 1930s, a man named Fritz Zwicky had actually noticed something weird. Not on paper, but an observation with a telescope. He was the first to realise that there was more to the universe than what could be seen. He observed clusters of galaxies and the forces that were holding them together and realised that they weren't sufficient if you could only have the mass that was associated with the stars you could see. He suggested that there may be more than meets the eye. However, Zwicky was an eccentric and weird man and very difficult to get along with, so nobody took him seriously. It has been predicted that there are about 10 times more mass in dark matter than in ordinary matter. So in 1974, Ostriker and Peebles announced that galaxies couldn't exist without dark matter. In fact, this was more matter than Zwicky had predicted. People didn't like Zwicky, and the new result got a bad reception too. They didn't like what it said. The world wasn't ready for dark matter just yet. Vera Rubin from the Carnegie Institution helped the cause though. She was researching galaxies and stumbled across something quite bizarre. Newton's laws of gravity governed everything. In space, gravity becomes all the more observable. If you plot the speed of planets against the distance from the Sun, we find that those closer to the Sun rotate faster, and those further away from the Sun rotate slower. If you plot these as a graph, this is called a rotation curve. It's typical of what you would expect with Newton's laws of gravity. The further away from the Sun, the weaker the gravitational force. And galaxies work the same way. In the 70s, Rubin was looking at the outsides of galaxies to study and discovered that when looking at Andromeda, that the stars as you went further and further out didn't slow down. And this was a surprise. These stars defied the laws of gravity. The rotation curve turned out not to be a rotation curve, 
it became clear that the understanding of galaxies weren't correct. The stars were moving just too fast. By the knowledge of the time, the stars should have flown off into space. There should not have been enough gravity to hold them in place. There needed to be something more, extra matter, to provide this extra gravity. Something was missing. The universe didn't appear to have enough mass to hold it together, but obviously something was there. The universe wasn't breaking apart. The answer appeared to be dark matter. The problem was, nobody had ever found any dark matter. According to predictions, dark matter has mass. And there's a lot of dark matter, 95 to 96 percent of the universe. So what's dark matter made of? At first, it was thought that it was just matter that didn't shine. For example, gas clouds, rocks and so forth. But there wasn't enough stuff. This accounted for less than 10 percent of the unanswered matter. The evidence indicated that dark matter wasn't made of atoms, but it had mass. It existed everywhere, but couldn't be seen. It was observed in measurements to affect hydrogen at the very edges of the galaxy, and this left scientists confused. Professor Tim Sumner from Imperial College in London started looking for these mass-giving particles of the dark matter, something called the neutralino. However, the particles don't appear to interact with normal matter in a detectable way. Professor Sumner has been searching for years, but to date hasn't detected any dark matter. Dark matter has yet to be detected. There are opponents to the theory of the existence of dark matter, but there are only two answers to the flat rotational curves as shown by stars in the galaxies. Either dark matter exists, or the laws of gravity are wrong, and gravity is much stronger in some places than in others. This theory is called variable gravity. From calculations, ordinary matter seems to make up only 4% of the matter as predicted by the Big Bang that should exist in the universe. Does that mean that 96% of the universe is dark matter? Other scientists predicted that the amount of dark matter based on some measurements of the effects of galaxies from Mount Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico would amount to about another 21% of the universe. This still meant that 75% of the universe's stuff was missing. The universe just doesn't make sense. Professor Saul Perlmutter from the University of California at Berkeley discovered something else disheartening. According to most theories on the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe should be slowing down. The universe was thought to either be slowing down in expansion such that the universe would keep on expanding but even more slowly as time went on, or it would slow down its expansion to such a point that it would actually stop expanding. Professor Perlmutter was measuring distant exploding stars and found that the universe was actually speeding up. This didn't fit in with the physics that science knew about. There was nothing in known physics that would explain why the universe would accelerate the expansion of the universe. Energy is proportional to mass, and energy is required to create an increase in the expansion of the universe. The interesting thing is that Professor Perlmutter calculated how much energy it would need to cause the accelerated expansion of the universe as he observed, and this energy translated exactly to the amount of missing stuff. He called this energy dark energy. It was something that could fill the gap. So finally, the universe made sense. It was 4% atoms, 21% dark matter, and 75% dark energy. This became what was called the standard model of cosmology. Then Professor Carlos Frank from Durham University decided to use the standard model of cosmology to create a universe and see what it looked like on the computer. When he modelled it with the proportions in the standard model of cosmology, what the simulation turned out was something that looked exactly like the universe as we know it. The shapes of galaxies were predicted accurately, the gravity, the way galaxies formed, pretty much everything as observed by science to date. These seem to validate the standard model of cosmology. 
Professor Dave Spergel from Princeton University designed a satellite called WMAT, which was to measure the standard model. It mapped the early universe, and the objective was to determine whether the early sky could evolve into what we could see today if the standard model was used, and using the dark matter and dark energy concepts. The, the results from this showed that it all fit. The only alternative that would explain the current universe is if Isaac Newton was wrong with his laws of gravity. That being said, we still haven't been able to detect any dark matter just yet. It's time for today's brain teaser. Who was Agnes Concha Bochaxiu better known as? The answer to that later in the show. Time for Pin of the Week. Today's Pin of the Week goes to Kenneth Simon from California in the US. Thanks for adding to the Frapper map and I hope you're enjoying the show. And if you want to become part of Pin of the Week, it's easy to become eligible. Just put down a pin with your name and location into the Frapper map on the website just like Ken did. Now it's time for the answer to the brain teaser. So who was Agnes Concha Bochaxiu better known as? She was Mother Teresa of Kolkata. Did you get that one right? So what's been happening in the world of knowledge lately? Well, it seems that teams of scientists from Canada and the US have found more evidence of accelerated melting of ice in the Arctic. The scientists concluded that year-round ice could disappear by the year 2040, and these findings were presented at a meeting for the American Geophysical Union. A paper discussing this appeared in the journal Geophysical Research Letters. The worrying thing is that by the end of November, we had around 2 million square kilometres less ice than in a normal year, and that winter ice is no longer recovering to its normal extent, according to Arctic sea ice specialist Mark Serres from the University of Colorado. These findings follow on exactly from what the Inuit people from the northern polar regions have been talking about for a long time. The number of communities are shrinking as a result of the changes in weather patterns. Adding to this, late last year, a huge ice shelf broke off an island in the Canadian Arctic, and experts say that it's the biggest break in 25 years, and it's said to be bigger than Manhattan. Australians have always said that we live in the lucky country, but in terms of climate, there's a downside to living with our sunshine. Climatologists have just reported that there's an enhanced greenhouse effect impacting Australia, which is already the driest continent on Earth. Temperatures are rising in Australia faster than in any other parts of the world, and out of the 20 hottest years in recorded history, 
15 of those have happened since 1980. Rainfall in the east and south of the continent have been at record lows and farmers are dealing with drought conditions. Professor Andy Pittman from the University of Sydney said, The really scary thing is, last time we had a drought of this intensity that lasted about five years, it lasted for about 50 years. The politicians truly believe this is a five or six year drought that will break sometime in 2007 or 2008. But it might not break until 2050 and we aren't thinking in those terms at this stage. Water supplies have become such a critical issue in Australia that many states have imposed water restrictions. In Victoria, where I live, new laws have come into place last week where any households that don't follow the water restriction rules, which include things like watering gardens, washing cars, filling pools, time restrictions and so on, will be hit with fines of $420 for serial offenders and the water authorities will have the power to restrict the water supply to those premises, making it impossible to have a shower. The water would be reduced to a trickle, so you could have a glass of water, but it would be a slow fill. A group of scientists from Murdoch University in Perth, Western Australia, have made an interesting discovery. They found that cloud formation is affected by the type of vegetation growing on the land below. Rain clouds tend to form above dark green native vegetation far more than over other types of vegetation such as pale coloured crops like wheat. Professor Tom Lyons from Murdoch University says that understanding this natural phenomenon would aid in working out strategies to combat drought and increase rainfall in areas that needed it. Greenhouse gases are well known by now to be causing global warming, but at the outer edges of the atmosphere, it is cooling and contracting the air at the edge of space, according to the journal Science. This cooling effect, alongside the warming effect in the lower atmosphere, has been seen before, on Venus, which has a runaway greenhouse effect, causing the planet to have extremely high temperatures, making it the hot hottest planet in the solar system. Scientists from the Czech Republic, the US, India and Germany have analysed the data and have found that the highest levels of the atmosphere is actually shrinking. I wonder what that means for the many meteorites that hit the atmosphere. Maybe they'll have a higher chance of hitting the ground if there's less atmosphere to go through, but that's just speculation. You're probably wondering at this point why the same greenhouse gases warm the air in the lower atmosphere and cool it at the edge, right? In the lower atmosphere it's more dense, so the gas molecules such as carbon dioxide suck up solar energy and continually collide with other molecules. The collisions pass that energy around and increase the temperature as a result. Whereas in the upper atmosphere there are less gas molecules to bump into, so the carbon dioxide molecules tend to take longer to bump into another molecule and radiates the energy off as infrared light in the meantime, which cools things down. This follows exactly the models that climate experts use. So those who claim that science behind climate studies isn't accurate should probably learn something more about science before commenting. We all know Einstein's equation E equals mt squared. We know we can get energy from mass. Just look at your typical atomic explosion. The energy in the explosion is directly proportional to the amount of matter undergoing fission, in most cases plutonium or uranium. But astronomers have recently found a cosmic duo, what appears to be a blue star, about 20 times the mass of our sun, and either a rapidly spinning neutron star, or it might be a black hole which is doing the reverse, they are converting light into matter. The two objects are very close, somewhere between 20 and 40 million miles. As a comparison, 
The distance between the Sun and the Earth, which is a planet, is 91 billion miles. So you can imagine the immense gravitational pull between these two celestial objects. The smaller companion, the black hole or the neutron star, is spitting out jets of particles from its poles at very close to the speed of light. These high speed particles create gamma rays, which are the most energetic kind of light there is. It's actually around a trillion times more powerful than the light you and I can see with our eyes. That's a one with 12 zeros behind it. And according to Dimo Kazanis, who's an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, this extremely high energy enables gamma ray photons to convert light into matter. The gamma ray photons created by the jets from the smaller object crash into photons from the blue star and together they have enough energy to create matter. The collisions themselves absorb the gamma rays through matter conversion. Dave Thompson from Goddard says that this is something that can only happen with gamma rays. Other forms of light don't have enough energy to do this. Recently, astronomers were puzzled to find a radio signal coming in from space that was very unusual. Why was it unusual? It was unusual because it was the first time ever that anions or negatively charged molecules have been found in space. Up to now, it was thought that all the molecules in space were either neutral or positively charged. The anion found was a chain of six carbon atoms and a hydrogen atom which had an extra electron. The radio signal of the C6H- molecule was found in molecular clouds in space and the emissions were detected years ago by Japanese scientists, but nobody knew where the signals were coming from. The C6H- molecule has now been found in more than one place, near an old red giant star in the constellation Leo and in a molecular cloud in Taurus. Patrick Thaddeus from the Harvard-Smithsonian Centre for Astrophysics reported on all of this in a recent edition of the Astrophysical Journal Letters. Astronomers have detected the glow of some of the first objects to form in the universe from about 13 billion years ago. To give you an idea of how ancient these objects are, the age of the universe is estimated to be 13.7 billion years ago, or the time when the Big Bang happened. The images were taken by NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, and the foreground images were removed, leaving only the remnants of the early universe. Professor Ray Norris of the CSI Rose Australia Telescope calls it the Holy Grail of astronomy. The objects in the image haven't been identified and confirmed just yet, Suggestions are that they're the first stars to form, in which case they would be massive, around a thousand times the size of our sun, or that they may even be black holes, in which case the images don't show the black holes, but the heat emitted by the matter getting sucked into them. The objects are very bright and very different from anything else that exists in the skies today. Professor Norris says that the next step is to actually find the objects themselves and to figure out what the objects actually are. If they are black holes, then astronomers would need to work out how objects of that size form so quickly after the Big Bang, since it's currently understood to take quite some time for black holes to form. Have you heard of asteroid 2006 XG1? It's making the news at the moment was discovered by the University of Arizona's Catalina Sky Survey, and NASA has revealed that, although the possibility is very remote, at a 1 in 45,000 chance, it does have the possibility of hitting the Earth. It's predicted to make a flyby of the Earth in 2041, and could come within 5,000 kilometers of the planet. Most scientists don't think it'll hit the Earth, but that's a little bit too close for comfort. The 
Meteorites hit the Earth every day. Most burn up in the atmosphere, but occasionally one will make it to the ground. It's been known for a while that some contain organic materials, but a recent meteorite which fell in Canada on the 18th of January back in 2000 has given scientists some more food for thought. After analysing the meteorite and cutting it open, they found small globular shapes, hollow spheres of organic material which would have been good for protecting early life forms, and the meteorite predated the formation of the solar system. Scott Messenger, the scientist at NASA's Johnson Space Center, said it's not a new idea that a lot of organic matter on Earth originally came from meteorites and comets. What is new here is that we've identified a new physical form of the matter and the source. So does this lend validity to the theories that life on Earth may have had origins from space? I guess we'll find out in due course. Some bacteria is well known to have the ability to survive extreme conditions, such as very high levels of radiation that would normally kill other life forms. It's been theorised by some scientists that these bugs could have only evolved to survive these conditions on a planet like Mars, and that they established themselves on Earth after hitching a ride on a comet. These are claims made in the journal Astrobiology by an American-Russian team. One suggestion is that impacts on Mars could have thrown rocks into space, which eventually found themselves crashing down on Earth. If the meteorites contained any forms of life, that could have given them the ability to set foot, so to speak, on Earth. The microbe Deinococcus radiodurans is probably the most well-known and, and most studied radiation-resistant microbe. Microbes such as this have led the team, led by the University of Arizona's Alexander Pavlov, to write in the journal Astrobiology, Our hypothesis of a Martian origin for radio-resistant bacteria provides an explanation for their ability to withstand ionizing radiation, a trait that appears to be of no value on Earth at any time in its history. Considering that levels of radiation on Earth haven't changed dramatically in its history, there wouldn't appear to be an evolutionary advantage in forming radiation resistance. A new report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science claimed that Neanderthal man had different ethnic groups and often suffered from starvation and even practiced cannibalism. The primitive Neanderthal man was thought to have existed primarily on meat and according to Antonio Rosas from the Department of Paleobiology at the National Museum of Natural Sciences in Madrid, there are two probable reasons why they ate their dead. One is that they needed to eat whatever was at hand, including human flesh, because ecological conditions for their survivorship, such as extreme cold weather and no meat from hunting, were really hard. The other possibility is that this was done in the context of something we may think as symbolic, he says. As for their ethnic groups, there appeared to be two distinct types, the so-called northern Neanderthals and the southern Neanderthals, the southern Neanderthals lived in the Balkans, Iberian Peninsula, Middle East and Italy, and had wider shoulders and shorter faces than their northern cousins, who lived north of the Pyrenees Mountains, the Alps, parts of Asia and Central Europe. Do you use deodorant when you go out, especially on a hot day? Have you ever wondered who invented it? Seems like a good idea, right? It might not have been humans who invented it. Monkeys actually use deodorants as well, as scientists have discovered recently in the Mexican forest. In the November issue of Primates, a paper states that male Mexican spider monkeys created a deodorant that they put on themselves by chewing the leaves of three aromatic plants, the Alamos pea tree, a flowering trumpet tree, and wild celery. 
Researchers have discovered that the monkey applies this natural deodorant one plant species at a time, so they're very organised it seems. The interesting thing is that the wild celery has antifungal properties and repels insects. The other two just smell good. The scientists concluded that this form of self-anointing may play a role in the context of social communication, possibly for signalling social status or to increase attractiveness. Sounds a lot like us humans, doesn't it? A materials engineering professor from Drexel University in Philadelphia in the US has made a claim that the Great Pyramids may have been made with concrete. If true, this would mean that the Egyptians predated the Romans in making concrete by thousands of years. The new study is based on a study by French scientist Joseph Davidovitz, who claimed that each of the pyramid blocks were cast in place using a wet mix of limestone particles with the binding material and then cast into moulds. The wet mix was theorised to harden into a concrete that ended up looking like limestone. If this was the method used, then it would mean that problems such as transporting such huge limestone blocks to the site of the pyramids would not have been the huge task that it's currently thought to be. A team from Drexel University used scanning and electron microscopy to analyse samples from the pyramids and determined that the blocks were a mix of carved stones and some of the limestone-based concrete. What they discovered was that the mineral ratios they found didn't exist in any known natural limestone. And on a related matter, the Pyramid Cheops, which is the tallest in Egypt, will have a robot equipped with cameras and sent down some narrow passages to the Queen's Chamber. Another robot was sent to the Queen's Chamber in 2002, but the robot was blocked about 50 metres away from the chamber by a stone wall or a door. Archaeologists hope, hope the new robot will be able to reveal more information and secrets, which may lead to the discovery of the tomb of Cheops himself. Cheops was a pharaoh around 4,500 years ago. Yeah, when I get to Africa, we're going to get it on because we don't get alone. I want to eat him up. <laughs> too much speed for him. Too fast. You're too fast. Give me like that. Say, I'm going to retire the heavyweight champion of the world. I'm going to retire the heavyweight champion of the world. September the 25th, the world will be stunned. <laughs> That's right. If you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I kick Fulman's behind. We all know Muhammad Ali, and we've heard his banter before and after matches, and even those of us not old enough to have been around at the time, his poetry is legendary. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You can't hit what you can't see. Well, apparently that was a quote from his trainer, Angelo Dundee, but you get the idea. George Lois has just written a new book called Ali Rap, Muhammad Ali, the first heavyweight champion of rap. And he makes the claim that rather than just advertising himself, Ali actually sowed the seeds of hip-hop and rap, which became popular the following decade during the 1970s. The author also did tell Ali that he thought he was a rapper, to which Ali replied, I'm a double rapper. First I wrapped them with my mouth, then I wrapped them in the mouth. If what Lois says is true, then it would mean that rap didn't originate in the Bronx in the 70s, but in Kentucky in the 60s. Even Chuck D, from the famous hip-hop band Public Enemy, supports the position by George Lois. He said about Ali, He was able to engage his social surroundings into his whole persona. That's what hip-hop was able to do, to be an antenna for social reflection. He's one of the few black people to get on TV in the 60s and speak their minds, thank God, and also back up what he talked about. I know there's a couple of songs about Muhammad Ali, but I, I don't recall any rap ones. Maybe someone should record one soon.
I've had a bunch of feedback since doing the last episode. Thank you to everyone who's commented or emailed. Those who've left a comment on the website, I've tried to respond where I can, but I don't think the software actually mails a response to you unless you check yourself. I have, however, put an RSS link on the right-hand side so you can see comments as they get posted. You can use any good RSS reader or even web browsers such as Firefox to subscribe to that. On to the feedback. Grant from, well I'm assuming you're from Port Hedland and that Port Hedland isn't your surname, voted on iTunes and left a comment asking about the songs that I play on the show. All the songs for each episode are listed on the website, so go to the website, click on podcast on the right hand side, and then click on whichever episode you want to read about, and then the show details will name the artist and title of each song used in that episode. Most of the music can be found on the Podsafe Audio Network at podsafeaudio.com, unless I've specifically mentioned otherwise, such as when a band or label allow me to use their music on air, in which case you'll have to go and buy the album. But even then, I try to list links to their website so you can go and find out more about them and their music. Gran also mentioned the short fadings in and out of the songs, but I'll work on that one for you. Mark Pike writes, Dear Ordinary Guy, Just found your podcast on iTunes and really like it. Nice blend of science fact and explanation and other stuff. One very small suggestion. While playing the episode, I was at work. The audio for your dialogue was quiet in comparison to the volume of the music that separated segments. This resulted in me having to continually turn the sound up or down. Is there a way to make the volume the same for your mic and music inputs? Maybe iTunes messes it up. Thanks again for the interesting podcast. Good feedback, Mike. Hopefully the following episode was was mixed a little better. I did episode 10 quite late, but I'll make sure I've got the mixing done as best as I can from now on. Phil from Western Australia left a comment on episode 11, and he says, Hi, Phil from Perth, Western Australia. Thanks for an interesting podcast. On the subject of time taken to accelerate to light speed, I make time equals V divided by A equals 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 19.6 equals 1.53 by 10 to the 7 seconds, which is what I got, but then... I said it was five and a half years, and Phil corrected me and said it was just under six months. So that's my mistake there, Phil. Thanks for correcting me. I think I was uh, trying to calculate too much in my mind at the time, but um, you're absolutely right. So to um, Andrew from Mount Eliza, I think it was, I hope I've remembered correctly, the answer to your question was closer to six months, as Phil pointed out, and not six years. It looks like I was an order of magnitude out. Thanks for that, Phil. Marcus in Melbourne writes in response to the story on the scientific definition of theory in the last episode. Hi, it's Marcus from Melbourne. Thank you for the great job on explaining the scientific use of the word theory with the common usage of the word. I also agree with your views on religion and evolution not being mutually exclusive, which is a view I've held for a long time. Thanks for the great work on the topic and for the podcast in general. He also wrote to me in an email. Wow, that was really well done. I've just been stunned by how well that entire segment was put together. Great brilliant work. Well, thanks for that, Marcus. I'm glad my explanations got your stamp of approval. Jess from Melton wrote, Hi, Ordinary Guy. I just found out what podcasts are, and I guess I'll learn more about it in the future. I'm from Melton, Victoria. Anyway, I wanted to say I like your show and to ask a few questions. I like how you don't talk too fast and the content is great. I was listening to the December show in which you mentioned two topics that really stood out for me. The first was about humans handling travelling at the speed of light, and the second was how researchers found animals using language to communicate with each other. At the end of your show, 
are forming an idea about human brains' ability to handle evolution. Are human brains, in this moment of human's existence, forced to work any harder than any other period of time? What parts of the brain are affected from stress, anxiety, etc.? The human mind or brain is the last frontier in my opinion. I recall reading that humans only use a small percentage of their brains. Which parts of the brains are modern humans actually using? How many parts of the brain can work at once? What parts of the brains are humans not using? Are there any parts of the human brain which are less used than other parts? What is bio and neurofeedback? Does it heal the brain? What is a SPECT scan? Can, animals, can animal species develop similar conditions to humans, for example schizophrenia, dementia, etc.? If not, why not? How much stress can a human brain handle, and is it evolving fast enough to handle the dramatic changes which are occurring? Have a good holiday, and hope Chrissy and New Year's don't get too hot for you. Jess. Oh, wow, Jess. That was quite a comprehensive comment. I can't answer all the questions you asked, and I suspect that even some experts in those areas won't be able to fully answer all you've asked. Some of the questions could be full shows in their own right, but in the meantime, I'll answer the bits that I can, and for the rest, if anyone else knows the answers or can point me to people who would know, please drop me a line, and I'll try to contact them, and hopefully that'll give Jess some more info to think about. You mentioned humans only using a small percentage of their brains. I think it was a quote from Einstein that said, we only use around 10% of our brains, but it all depends on how you measure it. In reality, we're using all of our brains, and different parts of the brain have higher activities during certain types of thinking and doing than other parts, and this changes depending on what you're doing. But if you're talking about things such as the ability to think, how much more could we think about? Do things like meditation help us access the subconscious or spiritual parts of our minds? Well, I'll make the distinction here between minds, which is a conscious view, rather than brains, which is a physiological view. Well, to be honest, I don't know. There are some who argue that the human mind is capable of a lot more than we currently understand. Things like high-end sensory perception and so forth. There's currently, however, no evidence for this. But this doesn't mean that it's not so. It just means that we don't know. Are we using 10% of our brains in terms of our ability to think? I suspect the number was arbitrary. But I think everyone would agree that pretty much all of us are mentally far more capable than we give ourselves credit for. We can all continue learning no matter how much we know or have already learned. Are we, at this point in time, forced to work our brains harder than any other time in history? That's a good question. We understand the universe a lot better now. We have higher order mathematics, various languages, and so forth. Does that mean our brains are working harder than in prehistoric times, when communication might have consisted of a bunch of different grunts? Perhaps. But being objective and measuring that would be a very difficult task. Neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback, but specifically targeted towards the brain. And biofeedback is a process that allows you to train yourself using technology that provides you with more information about your body than what your ordinary senses would. This extra feedback is supposed to help you to help use your mind to get better control over your body. Can it be used to help heal the brain? Well, the brain is an amazing organ. If something stops working properly, the neuropathways can be rerouted and retrained to use other pathways. I've read about experiments where they've cut out certain sections of the brain that are normally associated with certain functions, and the researchers found that over time, other parts of the brains took over. So if one was to train their brains using neurofeedback, I can't see why this shouldn't be the case. As for a SPECT scan, it stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography. Effectively, that's where a radioactive substance is injected into the body. This substance is then absorbed by tissues in the body and then measured by a camera that picks up photons as it's emitted by the radionuclide substance. This can then show things such as fractures, tumours, infections and blood flows to organs. They've been used for around 30 years. 
and can animals develop mind conditions like schizophrenia, dementia and so forth? That's also a good question. I do know that scientists have reported that things such as depression, which is normally associated with human beings, has been found in dogs. So really, I can't see why they can't develop other conditions to do with the mind. But I, I await feedback from the experts out there on this one. And I'll have to wait for an expert to answer your last question about how much stress the human brain can handle. Apart from asking nasty bosses, that would be a tough one to measure as well, I'm guessing. I hope that answers some of what you were wondering about, even if it is just scratching the surface. And thank you for your very comprehensive comment, Jess. Richard Eaves from Wagga Wagga wrote in and said, G'day, ordinary guy. You mentioned the bushfires in Victoria in this the tenth episode. We also were affected by the smoke here in Wagga. For your perusal, I've included a link to a photo I took from the outskirts of town, showing the sunset and the smoke. This photo is actually a combination of three photos joined to create a HDR image. Cheers and keep casting. Thank you very much for the image and your comment, Richard. For those who are listening to this podcast with a video iPod or MP3 player, or listening to the show on their computer or QuickTime or something similar, you'll be able to see the image that Richard sent me on the podcast image section. I'll also put an image of the sun I took from the morning of the podcast that Richard is talking about. Not as good as Richard's photo, but those of you not in Australia will see what we're talking about. Thank you once again for listening to the Brains Matter podcast for the 9th of January 2006. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please keep that email rolling in at mal at brainsmatter.com or leave a comment on the episode's show notes at www.brainsmatter.com and make sure you let me know where you're from and how you found the podcast. Music on today's show comes courtesy of Podsafe Audio and you can find the podcast by doing a search within iTunes or by subscribing manually by clicking one of the links on the website. Please leave comments and please vote for the podcast in Podcast Alley. And if you've already voted last month, be sure to vote this month as well. And I'll leave you with a quote from E.W. Dykstra. Computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. I hope you enjoy the show. Bye for now. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that's clear anybody to see. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I clever I would be. I'm not half as clever as me.